the thing I really do think, like, the thing I cannot stand is when people say, ah, oh, the Labour Party's like a family. Don't wash your dirty linen in public. Throughout history, the family has been the vehicle for the most terrible abuse that people won't talk about because you've got to keep it in the family. And I'm doing those annoying inverted problems. <laughs> All this stuff happens and it's not challenged because it's in the family. That's a, the worst possible thing you could ever say, in my view. But you, you and anyone that's crazy enough to listen to this might um, think differently. Hello and welcome to the Women of the Future podcast, a podcast made in collaboration with the Women of the Future programme, a platform built to unlock a culture of kindness and collaboration among leaders, as well as support and celebrate the successes of women. I'm Kim Rowell and I won the media category at their awards in 2018 in recognition of my continued work as a commissioner, producer and children's author, particularly within the mental health remit. I'll be talking to my guests on this podcast about their careers, who or what gave them their first big break, their successes, failures and inspirations along the way, and how they came to be a part of the Women of the Future Network. Currently a research fellow for Baroness Camilla Cavendish, Emily Benn is no stranger to politics. At just 17 years old, she was the youngest person ever selected as a British parliamentary candidate, standing for the Labour Party in both the 2010 and 2015 UK general elections. A reflection, perhaps, of a similar feat achieved by her grandfather, as in 1951, Tony Benn became the country's youngest MP, aged 26. Emily also has the accolade of being shortlisted for the Women of the Future Awards in 2008 in the voluntary sector. I caught up with her at her offices in Westminster. I grew up in South London. Uh, I was born in 1989. I caught the 80s by like 90 days, roughly, <laughs> which unfortunately means I am turning 30. <laughs> How does that feel? Uh, I decided to have a big party Ooh. to soothe the, the pain. pain. Except I realised how much it's going to cost in terms of going more with pain. Uh, no, it feels good. I mean, you grow up, right? I'm not sure your 20s are supposed to be your best decade of your life. I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, I really hope not. It's, it's where you done. make all your mistakes, I think. Well, exactly. And I mean, I've had a bloody great time, so I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up in, yeah, in South London, Crystal Palace. What it's was that like? Or place. Um, yeah, it was great. I liked football a lot when I was growing up, and I lived five minutes from Crystal Palace Stadium. It's handy. Yes, exactly, in Norwood where I grew up. So I used to go watch games, even though I was a Tottenham Hotspur supporter. Uh, but yeah, Palace was fun. And yeah, I mean, it was. I, I went to a very big primary school, like 120 people in my year. Wow. Which is quite wow. big for that does sound big. primary school. Yeah, four, four classes of 30 slash more, because especially at the beginning of primary school, we didn't have much resources. Um, yeah, so it was huge. Uh, had an amazing head when I was there. I remember that. Mr. Jenkins, who's still friends. I'm still, well, I say friends. I mean, I still call him Mr. Jenkins, even though I'm 30. Aww. All about almost 30. There's something quite weird about your teachers when you're little, because, like you say, you remember their names, don't you? Yeah, Mr. Jenkins. He's, he, the guy is a local legend, actually. I mean, he walks <laughs> down the street and he can't, he's stopped by everyone, and he remembers everyone's names, which is just, I mean, that's, that's kids crazy. that he would have been head under. I mean, th- thousands. And he remembers everyone's names, he remembers their brothers, their sisters, their mums, their everything. And the guy is uh, the, the guy is amazing. So actually, that was pretty cool to have him as a head, actually. And you're an only child, isn't No, it? I have a younger brother. A younger brother. Who's two, year, two years and two months younger than me. And he also went to Woodside. So yeah, that, the only time we went to school together was primary school. That was fun. Uh, I didn't, did I, I'm not a big fan of school, I have to say. Primary school, I had some trouble with a couple of people. I was a tomboy. I wanted to play football, they wouldn't let me play in the football team because I was a girl. Was it bullying or was it more the fact that you were pushing the boundaries? And uh, that you was, there were a couple of people that were really awful. But I was, de- I was bullied, bullied in secondary school. Mm. But I went to a girls' secondary school, so therefore the first three years of it were total hell. Mm. So I'm not sure it was, it was a you know, very quote unquote good school, but I, there were a few people that made my life kind of hell. The whole fat, you think fat and ugly thing. Oh really? You think it would have been better if it was mixed? No, I, no, I, I, well, I don't know. I, I, I mean, the thing is, it was tough for a few years and then brilliant. So, but I, I don't think you know, eleven when you were eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen year old girls, it's 
you're coming into your own, aren't that's you? What, I mean, it's you're not, testing the water. It's not, it, it's not, it's not, it's not surprised. I mean, I'm not surprised it was like that. I mean, it's a cliche, but it's true. But then, mm. you know, when people, I mean, it's a cliche, but when they matured, f- yeah. 15, 16, totally different ball game. You know, complete, completely different. So that was great. It got, as I say, it got much better. And I did lots of stuff at school. And I had, but the thing is, I had lots of, I had like a life outside of school because I, was massively into music because mm. I played the violin and that was like my life and my friends did were there. Did you play it well or was it a bit like a cat? <laughs> no, uh, I, I like to think pretty well. I mean, I went to the Royal College of Music. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. They were so really well. <laughs> okay, that's not just playing the violin. No, 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 no. It was like my life. Like I, was, oh, I was in the youth, I was leader of youth orchestras. Oh. I was, um, used to go on tour around Europe playing. Wow. Uh, that's impressive. Yeah, I mean, I got a music scholarship to university. I say the cat thing because I used to play the cello, and I think my poor mother actually. I, I mean, I'm not. I, I, obviously, I can't like. I am sure that for a significant time, from when I was five, <laughs> it didn't sound the most beautiful sound you ever heard. I am sure. I meant more like by fifteen, I'd stop sounding like a cat. Yeah. Okay, good. My brother is is a cellist, a professional cellist. So he? He's the actual musical superstar. But I had friends from that. I had friends from school. So I had friends from all that kind of stuff. So my life wasn't just school, which was good. But I mean, very lucky to parents who did everything possible. My dad used to call, my dad used to say that his job was a chauffeur because he's a doctor. <laughs> That's taxi. Chauffeur, exactly. Chauffeur, <laughs> people around, various activities. They both worked full time, which is totally cool. I like that. I think had my parents been around all the time, all day, it would have been a nightmare. That's good. <laughs> so, you studied, so you studied music at uni? Uh, no, actually I studied history and politics, but I got a music scholarship because uh, it just meant that I could spend, it gave me money for lessons so I could keep playing it just meant that I did more well I would have done it anyway but like I played in the university orchestra conducted the college orchestra all that kind of stuff so so you're hugely talented I, I you can only answer that question if you hear me and like it so <laughs> I could possibly say yes but I enjoyed it for my personal sanity it was great I really enjoyed it do you find it cathartic yeah it's a great escape for, so for me it's never something I would ever want to do professionally and I have now you know, having known and now friends with so many people who are professional musicians it's a very different thing because I it's my escape it's my passion it's my wonderful release it wouldn't work for my job did mm, you find you can't mix the two like you, if you did that for a job it would spoil it yeah exactly or... whereas for people that you know there are other people I know that music is their life you know, mm. they couldn't do anything else they would be unhappy if they weren't doing it that's not me <clears throat> and politics kind of got in the way anyway because my last year at school in between my penultimate and last year at school I became a parliamentary candidate so you know you really at some point you've got to prioritise Was a career in politics always on the cards? No and I wouldn't even say that I'm not even going to necessarily have a great career in politics but my interest in politics yeah that was always on the cards yeah definitely I was always interested by it I guess partly the age I was you know in 1997, you know, there's that big election and yeah. a big landslide, and it does make a mark on you when you're, you know, my age. Also, you don't have, really have to be 50 or a rocket scientist to realise that you are much luckier than other people when mm. you're, you know, when you're five, six, and seven. I think probably even more than any, you see it so starkly, you see it so nakedly. You know, my opportunities, as I said earlier, my, how lucky I was with my parents, with the opportunity I was getting with all the extracurricular stuff, that was not available to a lot of the people that I was going to primary school with and if you look at the primary school I went to it was you know, it was a brilliant school with brilliant teachers but it was not a St Thomas House or whatever the prep schools are around in London it wasn't you know nothing like that uh, and it's never really sat easily with me and I've maybe it's because having had tough times with how people treat you or bullying or etc like that like you, you I just naturally don't like it when you see something that's not right I guess it sounds a bit trite but it's kind of true so yeah so politics has always been an interest and yeah, my I can't not obviously my family are political. Yeah. Though none of my family, not like most of the other people in my family my age, they don't like politics. So it's, the, it was certainly not inevitable. But you came to it at a young age, right? You yeah, started, yeah. That so. that's because I that that is definitely because I was exposed to it. Mm. So I was exposed to it a lot earlier than other people, and I and I was you know taught that it wasn't this awful terrible thing. I was taught that had the the potential to do good, which I I still think, but. It, it also has the potential to not work. So I think I, I I was aware of it much earlier, obviously because of my family, but it's not like it was inevitable that I do it because of my family, because then everyone in my family would do it, yeah. and they don't. Yeah. <laughs> far, literally far from it, it's just me that's interested in it. I guess it's just the type of person I am. I've never, I guess my issue is I hate complainers that don't do anything about it. 
couldn't agree more. And I, because maybe because I've grown up with someone, I'm not going to say who, but who complains all the time, does absolutely nothing about it, and it drives me absolutely bonkers. And this, you have to mix this off, obviously, with, as I said, growing up thinking that politics was something worthwhile and that it can change things, and the age I was in 97 and stuff changing, and you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to see my school, my hostel, you know, it, it was there. It was changing, it was getting better. I associated that with a way of changing things, mm. or the ability to try and change things, and you know, if you believe in something, stand up and say it. And don't let the... My, my mother used to write this post-it note saying, don't let the bastards get you down. So that has been a... <laughs> she's <laughs> right. A though. constant, my motto, probably. Two mottos there, don't let the bastards get you down. It will all be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end. I do quite a bit of work with that mentoring and volunteering, and whenever you hear disgruntled young people, I always just tell them to be the change. And it sounds really naff. No, but it's like you're never going to see change or you know be part of it if you don't do no, something. Exactly. People don't recognise their own agency and it drives me mad. Mm. It drives me mad with politicians now. Yeah, they're paralysed by fear, I get it. But politics is also about leading and showing people or trying to persuade people that mm. your way of doing things is better for them and better for their country, etc. It's... Uh, yeah, I just have a different concept of what it can be. Yeah. Maybe that's maybe and maybe that's my upbringing that has helped infuse that. Though if you ever ask any of my family, there's, then they would be very clear I am my own person. <laughs> <laughs> Strong uh, will. Yeah. Or? Well, just I'm not, not going to think something just because someone tells me to. I don't really get the point of that. I'm clearly, very disappointing with some people that I do have my own views that are not mm-hmm. carbon copies of people I may be related to. But they are. I just I can't cope with pessimists. I'm, I'm all up for realists, but pessimists, I just, uh, God's sake, I can't, I just can't, I can't do it. And I've never been able to do it, as I said, so the combination of that and thinking that politics can be, can do things, just get on with it and do it, mm. I don't know, just, just do it. It's funny when, <laughs> when people are like, oh, what would you want in a boyfriend or whatever? My, my first thing I now say is like someone just always looking to say yes rather than no, you know. Positivity. Yeah, I was just... All the people that are constantly trying to say why it won't work or why you shouldn't mm. do it, it's, what, why? <laughs> it drives me mad. But that's just me. In what ways do you feel the effects of your grandfather's legacy? Does it inspire you or does it intimidate you or is it a little <clears> bit of everything? Uh, you're, obviously you're proud of him. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's my grandfather. It would be yeah. sad if I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. I'd be a bit strange. Well, yeah, I mean... But I, and some people quite find this quite difficult apparently to understand, but you can separate political views from personal relationships. Mm-hmm. And part of the problem that we are in at the moment is that people don't seem to be able to separate the two. And if I look at my own, well, the Labour Party, I should say, this purity of you're either with us or not only do we not like you, but we hate you and you mm. should have fought for It's just utterly ludicrous. I wouldn't speak to half the people I know if that were the, well, <laughs> if yeah. that were the case. Yeah. People I've related to, it's just ludicrous. How on earth do you change people's mind or bring mm. people with you or understand other points of view if that's real brief? So, yeah, he, um, Dan Dan, as I, I called him, so well, I can't call him his real name. So, uh, I would never call him that when he was alive, so what's <laughs> the point? And uh, Dan Dan, yeah, I mean, um, my mother's family is all abroad, so um, I was incredibly close to him because they were my grandparents that were here. Actually, saying that my mother, my mum's mum, did actually live a lot of the year here and India. But my, yeah, I mean, he was my, he was Dan Dan, so yeah, he was political. I mean, you know, it's different because, you know, it's a cliche, but you know, you try going with him down the road to Boots or whatever, and it would take an hour because people would stop, stop him, and, yeah. or he would stop people. It was he was just as bad as yeah. It wasn't the people going up to him. He he, he really and he asked all these questions and. <laughs> Constantly smoking his pipe, and any time he got in a taxi with him, he'd always say to the cab driver, "Do you mind if I was off my pipe?" Even though there were massive signs everywhere saying, "No smoking, smoking. Yeah. no smoking, no smoking." But he didn't even like the damn thing. He sometimes he just you know, habitual puff it. Yeah, yeah. with nothing there. I hate. I don't really like pipe smoke, but I did get used to it. I, I take the stuff from it. The stuff that I take from him that uh, uh, matters to me, which yeah. is say what you mean and mean what you say. He always used to say that. Yeah, you know, he was friends with people that. I completely disagreed with him, and he he respected people even he didn't agree with them, which I do with lots of people that politically I don't agree with, but I respect them, so I think I probably did get that from him too. Yeah, I mean, he casts a long shadow, but 
Yeah, he was born in 1925, mm. four. Oh God, I should know that. 1926. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're close. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a completely different time, completely yeah. different life. Um, How do you think he would feel now? Because the leader of the free world is tweeting and... Yeah, I mean, I, he, he kind of missed the Twitter wave, I think. Yeah. I think he did make a tweet once. Do you think he would have been prolific? Or do you think he would have... On Twitter? Yeah. Yeah, he actually he bloody loved technology. He was always did the he? first adopt... Yeah, he, was the, he always had all the latest gadgets. He was mm. obsessed with it all. So, yeah, he probably would have done. Do you think he would have used it as a platform, though, to, like, make probably, statements? Probably, but I think he would also have not liked the that bad, bad side of it. Yeah. Because you had problems yourself, didn't you? Yeah, I get. I mean, any time I say anything, and it's uh, and mostly invoking him. I get. Yeah, there was a time where I got thousands of this stuff, really, in a very short space of time. But you know, the classic. Yeah, you know, he's turning in his grave. I have to keep reminding people that he was cremated, so there's no grave. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. But... The body cannot turn <laughs> because the body is not there. How do you feel about it? Well, that I just think is stupid because yeah. I mean I know I, I, it's silly, and also I mean, I would just not say that to someone. Mm. I don't, maybe I was too well brought up, but I would never dream of saying that to someone because and especially someone you don't know. Yeah, or and, but no even if you did know him, it, I, I don't know what kind of person assumes that they would know a relationship between two people better than the people involved. Well, quite. And that I find annoying, and not because I find it upsetting because it's obviously wrong, but I just find it annoying that these people. But if, if, if this belies the people that are doing it, and I'm like, well, if you think that, then God yeah. knows what else you think is appropriate to say. But I don't like it when people are like, I don't want to have kids in case one of them has a kid, like Emily Ben, and I don't like it when they're like, have they said things like that? Yeah, yeah, well, lots. So I don't like it when they say wow. you should adopt because you're ruining the bloodline. I don't like it when they say you're. How do you take that? Because it's the, the, you should change your name thing. I normally respond by saying, well, if that means you're offering to marry me. Let, you know, let me know uh, if you've got a potential no. husband. <laughs> that, you know, I'm like, I'm trying, for Christ's sake, to find a husband. So, it's not like I'm not trying. Give me a chance. Yeah, exactly. You know, just seriously. But that must affect you. This must affect you. you it, it, be... it, it, normally it doesn't, but there are occasions where... It's, and, and it's annoying, because sometimes it's just one I read, and I'm like, what? It's, mm. and, you, and the problem is, the minute you argue with these people, you, you get lost in this... You get engaged in... Stupid and, yeah. argument, and the shame, and... I'm not arguing that he probably would have disagreed with some of my political positions because no shit, we disagreed at the time when he was alive. So it would be very strange from beyond the grave for him to suddenly change his mind. But I mean, but you're human, so you would have disagreed. You know, you have your own intelligence. Yeah, can, can anyone name me someone that they know that agrees with them on everything? I don't think I, I would never. I doubt I'll ever meet the person. I don't think I necessarily want to. Be quite boring. It'd be unbelievably boring, and you know, what about, I'd think, oh, well, what about my free thought? Mm. But yeah, so I, I, it annoys me. It annoys me, and it happens a lot. And it annoys me that it happens to people in the Labour Party. Most of you, probably a lot of them, definitely were not really Labour supporters when I was slogging my guts out from literally the <laughs> from when I can remember slogging my guts out for the Labour Party. I don't, you know, they accuse people of disloyalty when they weren't even in the Labour Party, and I was, mm. yeah, my whole bloody. I spent years doing stuff at weekends and after after school, you know. Anyway, yeah, it annoys me. But are you still a Labour supporter? Well, he's... well, I find it very difficult at the moment. I can't, I can't do something. I can't support something that I think is, you know, arguably institutionally racist. I mean, it, it's difficult. I uh, I can't support a leadership that I think is like that. And if you look at the way that they respond to criticisms of stuff like anti-Semitism, whether it's accusing the ex-staff members of having mental illness or whether it's all that kind of stuff, how can you support it? And I have changed my mind on this, you know, I used to be loyalty above everything and again maybe my, obviously my upbringing has something to do with this, like the Labour Party was, also it was doing really good things at, at the time, tangible things that I saw I should say, because I, you, know, you have to feel it and see it, but it really was where I grew up, it really was. And I, I, it used to be this institution that I never, I never, I never thought it could do no wrong. Obviously, because I disagree with lots of it all the time. Because you do with the political party. I'm not one of those. I'm afraid people that think it has to be 100 percent what they agree with. Well, sorry, what, what, on what planet is that going to be a part a political party? I mean, come on. I never hated opponents, with the possible exception of like the BNP, that kind of stuff. Obviously, I did, but I never hated opponents, unlike people do now. 
There was a really nice photo of Tony Blair, John Major and Paddy Ashdown. Yeah, I mean... All just having a laugh and a joke together. Yeah. And I just don't think you would get that now, would you? No, and, and yeah, I, I, this is not a point about not allowing passionate debate about issues. Like, I, I can't stand what some of the Conservative government's done. Mm. But that's not enough for me to just... That's not enough to, to love the Labour Party. And, you know, maybe in the, in the past, maybe I did fall in the trap of, well, they're awful, you've got to do this. But they've got to... It's not, you can't take it for granted. Like, nothing has a God given right to exist, and you certainly don't have a God given right for people to vote for you. Mm. I find it very difficult. I really do. And I, I, it's not, a, it's maybe not a satisfactory answer, but I just don't know what the hell to do because the, cl- the classic cliches, but I had massive trouble with them not campaigning properly to stay in the European Union, and that was a long time from a long time ago. Because that part of the Labour Party was always massively anti the EU. I would know. <laughs> My grandfather was very anti the EU but I I think it's very difficult I think it's really silly full stop to try and think what someone who's not around would think now because Mm. you have no idea people are way more complicated than you think yeah and when they're alive let alone when you have no idea so I I don't really like that line of argument Mm. you have the right to change your mind as well you certainly have the right to change your mind and the circumstances how do you know Mm. and even if you had a view if the the circumstances change in the if you do that what it might then consequently enact that yeah. you're massively against. How, how, how on earth do you know? So, you know, I find it, I really, I find it really difficult. I, I'm a bit politically homeless, but I haven't really changed my, I haven't really changed my fundamental view of how politics should operate or what politics can be or what works or, you know, evidence-led and listening to people that disagree with you and not being... <laughs> I, I just I, I find the issue of anti-Semitism I, I just I can't get over it and I, you know when I, I like to look at myself in the mirror and think I'm not one of those people that will let bad things happen I don't want to be one of those good people that let it happen so I'm not going to be and I don't understand how some Labour MPs just obviously just put these blinkers on and just mm. uh, accept it and how can you stand for a party or, or a leadership that you, you, you know and you will admit privately it, it is, it's not fit to run the country how can you do that and, you know, they get away with it by saying, oh, but I'll be an MP that's, do-, you know, oh, you wait for me as the MP. I don't know. I, I, I don't think you can do that, personally. But everyone's got to make their own decisions. Are you a bit torn? Or are you just... Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm lost. I'm not torn. I'm lost. I don't know what represents my values. I'm, I'm, I know what I'm not. I'm not, a, my, I'm not a conservative. I mean... And some of the stuff that's happened since 2010, you look at the consequences. I was living in America for three and a half years. Came back, I mean, within a day, you realise that the, the, the rough sleeping over crisis is just... And the numbers back it up. But that's a consequence of political decisions. You look at some of the, the people that have had their trouble on, you know, at universal credit. And you see, you see Conservative MPs celebrating the opening of food banks, which I find strange. I thought you politicians used to celebrate the opening of hospitals or schools yeah. or new local authority housing. I didn't realise that food bank oh, food banks was something to celebrate. I really find that odd. I see Conservative MPs celebrating. I'm like, it's because I mean, this is a lot of these people are a consequence of your political decisions. I mean, thank you to the incredibly charitable people that are doing it. But my gosh, we're like the sixth largest economy in the world. Are you really telling me that? that you have to be in that situation. So I'm not a conservative at all. And there's a lot about the injustice that gets me more angry and I can't stand it, but I'm lost. Because I don't think racism is a price to pay. And you can't say don't pay for them, they're racist, when you've got <laughs> mm. you've got the same problem yourself. I don't know, I just can't cope. The kind of party before anything approach, I just don't get. Like I said, maybe in the past I was a bit too late before everything, but... The problem is when you're in that approach, all manner of sins happen. But the thing I really do think, the thing I cannot stand is when people say, ah, oh, the Labour Party's like a family. Don't wash your dirty linen in public. Throughout history, the family has been the vehicle for the most terrible abuse that people won't talk about because you've got to keep it in the family. And I'm doing those annoying inverted problems. <laughs> um, look what happens. All this stuff happens and it's not challenged because it's in the family. That's a, the worst possible thing you could ever say, in my view. But you, you and anyone that is crazy enough to listen to this might um, think differently. But yeah, so basically, all that rambling, no doubt, <laughs> makes me... I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew. At I'm, least you're passionate. You I get, am, but I've got no... I, I don't know what positive outlet to it. But you also look a little bit sad, so... I am really yeah. sad, because it's my, my country. Yeah. I know. Everyone think it's all going really swimmingly? 
Do you? I don't know. I don't think anyone does right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I really worry about what might happen next. I really worry about good people doing nothing on the right. I really worry about legitimizing a lot of stuff. I've been living in a problem is I was living in America and I saw what happened. I saw quote unquote people that should know better mm. let bad stuff happen. And then you allow a president of the United States to, to have, whip up a crowd saying yeah. send her home, send her home. It's fascism. It, it's terrible. It's scary. I it's unbelievably scary. scary. And the problem is people are so complacent and they think it will just get better. It doesn't get better if people do nothing. And that's what's happening. So yeah, I'm scared. I am actually very uneasy. Which, and yeah, I studied history and I always wonder what it was like for people in periods where it was all about to get a lot worse, what they felt. And I have very bad feelings. <laughs> they felt quite sneakily bad. The feeling of foreboding. Yeah. I never really bought into the foreboding feeling, but I really don't feel good at the moment. Because I think bad things can happen. And I, I, and, and I come from a very multicultural family, as I, maybe I alluded to earlier. And my mum talks about her experiences of racism in the 60s. I was mm. like, God. And the problem is, what politicians and the public and the media allow legitimises people. That's the problem. It legitimises people to act in a way that they would never otherwise have done, and that has terrible consequences. And this is exactly what we are living in now. So I'm an optimist, but this is really testing me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty unsatisfying yeah. answer. No, it's a very interesting answer. It's an honest answer. It is a very honest answer as well. Right, let's talk about happier things. Yeah. So tell me how you got involved with the Women of the Future. Ah, now that's, yeah, the one good thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Pinky, I got contacted because I had been nominated or, or someone said I should nominate for this, um, for the Women of the Future Awards in 2008. Because I was at that point the youngest parliamentary candidate. I think I'm still the youngest person ever to have won a selection. How old were you? 17. Wow. Yeah, so I, um, I was the youngest, yeah, I, I think I'm the youngest person to win a selection um, how did that come about if for people that don't know how do you bit, get selected? Bit of a, yeah I, I mean, unintended consequences good people doing nothing and then me accidentally being it no they were um, it's a funny story but I a friend of mine were in this constituency involved in the local Labour Party my friends from music college actually and their parents and they said oh they're looking for a candidate why did you apply I just done my AS levels I thought this would be an interesting experience for maximum five four weeks over the summer Test yourself out, have a few mm. discussions, make a speech, no one vote for you, go home, get on with your life, apply to university. But I did it, and I'm not the kind of person that does stuff half assed If you have a kind of Indian mother, they don't really let you do stuff mm. <laughs> half assed so That's my approach to life. If you can do something, do it properly. So, you know, I tried and I, I applied. I sent my CV in, and it was a very, look, it was a very conservative seat. So these are not people expecting to be the next member of parliament. And it was an interesting time. Tony Blair had just left. Uh, Gordon Brown had just taken over. It was kind of a weird time. No one thought there'd be an election in October. So even if I got selected, I thought, well, it'll be done in two months. And then I... And I never thought age should be a barrier to, to politics. I mean, I don't like people that say, you're oh, ex, you don't have an opinion. Of course you should be free to express your opinion. You don't have to agree with it, but you should express it. So yeah, I applied. And, and for some reason, I managed to get into the long list. And I was at a music course in Dorset. My parents were on holiday and me and my brother had come back to do this music course because I was still doing mm. this music. And um, they invited me to this, this long list meeting where I'd have to make a speech and answer questions. And uh, so I had to drive down. I mean, this is how unseriously my family took it. My mother was so freaked out about me driving on a motorway by myself. She had no interest in what I was going to do. She was just really concerned about motorway driving. It's such a mum thing. Yeah, <laughs> so I was 17. They, they, they were not here. They were really worried. My little Toyota Yaris, that somehow is still on the road, I really don't understand that. Um, <laughs> it was a bit battered even then. But I made it, and I made the speech, and I answered questions, and for some reason I got in the top three. So I thought, wow, okay, this is going to go on a few more weeks. But I did it properly. I went to talk to people. I talked about what I was interested in. I talked about my, what, you know, what I thought, and I talked about trying to engage more people. And East Wales and Shaw and has a pretty old demographic anyway. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, the Labour Party had a pretty old demographic and I just talked about, look, we should just get a few more people interested. Actually, one of the best things I look back on it is that A, that party grew uh, in the context of everything falling. More young people, I've got pe two people at local councils there now that I found and energised. So That's great. You, make, you, make a, you make a small difference. And anyway, for some reason I won. The guy I was a candidate against was an A&E doctor, an A&E consultant. So the idea that I was going to win was so ludicrous. I had nothing to lose. And as ever, you perform very well. When you yeah. Can literally nothing to lose and I won and my, I remember my dad 
who came to you know be moral support he couldn't be in the room he sat outside and he just was just couldn't quite believe it um, and then because there'd been some problem with the a and consultant's car we had to drive him home so oh, we couldn't no. even really talk about it oh no <laughs> so the, poor the, guy the celebrations were kind of tempered but he was very nice he stood somewhere else so he, was, he was really nice um, so yeah so I got selected and I was the candidate and then we thought there'd be an early general election there wasn't so I ended up having been a candidate for three years, which was the most unbelievable experience, and actually how wonderful, because you do it for six weeks, you get nothing out of it. I learned a huge amount, I like to think I did something. Um, it was difficult for the first year, because I was at school, and the school absolutely hated it. <laughs> they were not, not happy at all, because they had no control over it. And, you know. It's funny, other schools used to ask me, invite me to come and speak to their students, because how amazing, there's this person in my school absolutely hated it, it was really funny. This was the reasoning behind you being nominated for a Woman of the Future yeah. award. Okay, that's how I got that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that was a long story. It's just I still look back and it think I, it doesn't feel like me, but it was in fact me. But yeah, so that's how I got it. And then to Gemma and Alexis, I got in touch, and I had to send in a few details. And I remember dropping it off in their then office. And then I met this woman called Pinky Delaney, and then my life pretty much changed. My life would not have been the same without this organisation or Pinky. She is quite incredible. All Gemma and, Le- and Alexis. Yeah, her team are yeah. amazing. As and well. then Iman and, you know, mm-hmm. about the time it was Gemma and Alexis. And then I got, you know, got to the award ceremony. It was amazing. I'd come back down from it. And then what really changed was, you know, this Pinky organised this Women in the Future trip to India and invited me. And I, I, I was just so keen to go. And I, I was so desperate because it looked amazing. And I couldn't believe I'd been invited when I looked at some of the other people that were going, you know, partners at KPMG and the Vice Chancellor University. And I just thought this is ridiculous. But I really wanted to go. I didn't have any money because I was a student. And any money I did have, I spent printing leaflets. Um, As you do. So I just asked around for sponsorship. And then I, some, a company very kindly sponsored me. And I went. And it was just unbelievable to be around that. It was, I found it inspiring. I get inspired by stuff like that. I get, it's a weird mixture of inadequacy and inspiration, I find, the women of the future. Because it makes you feel unbelievably inadequate. It's true, it's true. It's a weird mix. You sit there going, oh, God, I, what am I doing in my life? It's terrible. And then you just go out being inspired, so it's fine. But it's, it's a weird mix. But yeah, I try and do anything for Pinky. I've gone literally all over the world for Pinky. When I was mm. trying to, I had some exam. I was, went to um, Harvard uh, to do a, a grad degree and a graduate program, I should say. And I had some exams, but there was the Women of the Future in Singapore, and I somehow managed to postpone that paper deadline so I could go to Singapore, and just, mm-hmm. you know, anything for her. But you meet the most amazing people, and, <clears throat> and the ones I met from that India trip, which is 10 years ago now, have been, you know, constant support. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm unbelievably lucky. And the people that have put in a lot of their time and effort and energy, it, it makes a massive difference to someone like me. Can you tell us more about what you do now, the work that you do? Yeah, um, so I've just finished this graduate programme and then I, I was, I've been a research fellow with a woman called Baroness Cavendish, who I work for. She published, but I helped write this book about social care and ageing demographics called Extra Time. And it was fascinating and, and that's what I'm trying to do now at the moment is build some ideas about how you transform social care in this country because it's completely bankrupt. Mm. And I'm also working with a few people trying to work out how you get a more anti-tribal political culture. Because the thing that I have found the most difficult about this whole thing is the tribal nature of politics. And I've seen it. Even though I was supposedly part of the tribe, I'm, mm. you know, I'm not because I'm not totally pure. So I'm working with a, a few people trying to, to work out how you can take the heat out and how you can get the good, the, the people that want to work together find a space for them to do that but it is incredibly difficult in the context of what we're the political life we're living in it's difficult because the Labour Party is undergoing this unbelievable trauma <coughs> and I don't know how it ends up but trying to work out if there is a, a way of doing it it's worth trying for a bit and as I say I've literally just moved home so I'm also trying to work out what to do because I feel a bit homeless politically which I know for most people and I don't think about politics all the time because A, it would drive you. I mean, you would just be driven to distraction and be there's much more to life. And I was a local, you know, in my 20s I was a local councillor and it was a huge honour and I really liked that. And it has downsides, it, it does mm. have downsides to your life. And if at some point I decide I want to like debate myself for absolutely full time, quit up, wait full time to politics, it's never been my job. You know, I worked in a bank, I worked in investment banking which obviously people in the Labour Party hate. 
mean, that's another silly thing, hating people because they worked in a I mean, why? I mean, it's just stupid. It sounds like you're trying to make sense of it all. It's a difficult time to make sense of it. Mm. I, I can only answer honestly. Yeah. I wish I could give you some spiel, but I don't have one. And I don't want to sound like a... I don't, I'm really not a millennial, millennial in some ways. But you are just trying to figure out your life, right? I moved home. I, I thought maybe I'd make America my home, but I did find that really difficult. And the reason I left working in a bank in New York is because I was surrounded by people that were basically Trump supporters, and I couldn't do it. So you learn your limits. It's not part of growing up, you learn experience. Yeah, I learned my limits. And good people who cared just about their tax rate were willing to allow stuff to happen. And I found that really hard, you know? Talking about good people doing nothing. I've seen it, and I've seen the consequences in America. You know, I trampled around a bit so much. And my family is American, you know? My dad's family is American. My grandmother was only ever American. My dad's mum. You know, part of my heritage is there. Um, but it's difficult. Uh, maybe I'll spend some more time in India. I, I spent six months there, my mum's family. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm happy with what I'm doing for now, and we'll see if it works, but it's, it's not easy. I just want good government. I think I always have this view of politics that, like, you should just elect people to make good decisions on your behalf, and if they don't, you change them. I mean, that's not rocket science. I, I, that's democracy. Yeah, that's representative democracy. I like representative democracy, I don't like direct democracy. Because then you end up in a situation like we're in now, where people voted for something, but you have no idea what it is. Mm. Then you rely on people that didn't want it in the first place to implement it. Um, I just think like, the nature and tone of our political debate is so awful. And unfortunately, media has, does have a part to play in this, whether you like it or not. They're free to write whatever they like, as they should be, but they, I think they should be more responsible about it. It's not a question of forcing them to do anything. People should be more responsible. OK, I have some quick-fire questions. Yeah. What would you describe as your greatest success? Um, I guess it'd have to be being selected and the youngest. It was a pretty cool... It was a, it was a, and then doing something with it, not for its own sake, but then actually doing something I was pretty proud of. And your greatest failure? Hmm. <laughs> so many. <laughs> <laughs> do you see failure for what it is, or do you think this is a learning experience? I try and always take something positive out of it. Yeah. A lot of personal life fa failures. Yeah, I've got a whole personal life stuff that hasn't always gone brilliantly. You know, not marrying the man I wanted to. Oh. <laughs> That's an honest answer. That's a very honest answer. The mantra of the woman of the future, as you know, is kindness and collaboration. What does that mean to you? Uh, it kind of means everything. And hopefully the thread of what I've said is understanding people, not being rude and understanding where they're coming from. That's kindness. Trying to do something to help if you possibly can. And collaboration. Collaborating is, is the only way you make things work. My God, being a Labour candidate in a Conservative area, if, the, if I said F off to every person that disagreed with me... You wouldn't get anywhere. You wouldn't get anywhere, and nor should you. But we don't have enough kindness or collaboration. And when you see it in practice, you see the difference it makes. Is there anything that scares you? Yeah. Used to be the dark. Uh, when I was very young, I thought that Osama Bin Laden was hiding in our toilet upstairs. <laughs> That is so random. I know. And for reasons why I, did you think I have that? no idea. I don't even know why I knew who Osama Bin Laden was, because obviously most people really kind of knew him after 9-11. Yeah. But I'm, this was before 9-11. I was 11 by that point, so I did you not think that he was hiding in my toilet. You thought he was in your loo? My upstairs toilet. I was always very upstairs. I was always very scared of going upstairs in the dark. I mean, when I was like three. Yeah. I think you're allowed to be. Yeah, you are. Yeah. In, a, in, a old, in a Victorian old house, it creaks, you know. And but when did the Osama bin Laden thing come I don't know, <laughs> and I'm not sure when that came in, and I really want to know. <laughs> you should ask your mum, your dad. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why, but I just remember this great feeling of relief when he was caught. <laughs> He's not in my toilet in any anymore. house in Pakistan. Uh, that he was not actually in... South London. South London. <laughs> in my, no, it, I don't know why, what scares me. Uh, I know this sounds really weird, but like, one and two P coins, like, freak me the hell out. I can't see them. It's like a weird thing. What? what? I don't know, it makes me feel sick. So they don't scare me, they make me feel sick. I don't know why, How, and my, it drives my <laughs> dad insane. It's a little strange. It's just a thing, right? Okay. I don't know why, it makes me feel sick. I don't know. Don't I wish I could describe it because it annoys me. I um, don't necessarily need two P-coins either. You don't need either of them. Well, no, so really. you can't buy anything with one. No. So I just personally get rid of them. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> what scares me? 
I mean, there's like the whole big stuff that kind of scares me, but you can't get weighed down by fear. I, little stuff scares me, but if you let the whole picture weigh you down, then you're, you're done for. What does scare me? Well, I'm scared of the cliches. Spiders, snakes, not, I mean... Death? Death. If you get yourself... I mean, again, if you're... If I'm going to go around saying I'm scared of death... It's a downward spiral. You never do anything. It? Yeah, you just wouldn't leave the house. Well, exactly. You can die in your house as well, so... Well, yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? Go down the stairs. Bubble wrap. If you have scared, yeah. exactly. I mean, there must be, there is stuff that scares me. What am I scared of? Oh, my little nephew wanted me to pick up a crab. <laughs> I'm here on holiday. And I found that a bit scary. Yeah, I don't, yeah they've got little pincer things. Yeah. I mean, he's scared, I mean, he, he, but the thing is, he was so kind of, maybe he was eight, three, four. He was so kind of, um, just do it. No, I was yeah. like, okay, I'll have to do it. <laughs> Kids only have two fears when they're born, loud noises and falling. Everything else is learned. Yeah, so, I mean, why, yeah, why should you be? What, uh, what, what should I be scared? I'm just thinking, maybe I'm missing something. But if you're not, then that's great. The dark. The dark. You got it's over a that. a bit of a cliche. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit scared of the dark in the countryside because it's so dark. Yeah, and it's quiet. I'm a city girl. And so. you hear things flapping. Yeah. Birds and, and, like, bats and owls yeah. and, yeah. I'm scared of getting mugged. You know, there's a lot of crime. There was a poor, oh my gosh, there was a 16 year old boy, a poor guy that was stabbed on my road, almost died. That's terrible. So I'm a little scared of that, which I think is a fair scare. I think everyone is more aware. I feel like I'm more aware of having my mobile phone out. Yeah, or... well, my phone was just stolen. But that, not violently, but from my but from my bag, they, I was, well, I was wearing, they're professional people, these guys. That was a pain, I guess I'm not scared of it. When you're on holiday. Yeah. No, I, I am scared of like, being violent. Mm. Because, it, it, because it actually happened right outside, so it, it just makes you realise that it's, 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 it's done. not a... Mm. You know, I'm not reading the front page of the newspaper saying, oh, it could happen here. Yeah. Like, it did actually happen yeah. there. I'm scared I will die alone. No, oh. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Eat that, my Alsatians. Uh, yeah, Bridget, exactly. Bridget Jones Yeah, style. Bridget Jones guys. <laughs> I don't want to compare myself to Bridget Jones. But on the other hand, I wouldn't mind ending up with Martin Darcy. She's quite cool. There's things about Bridget that are... Perfect. Colin Firth was my first love, so... Um, I might be with you on that. From Pride and Prejudice. (gasps) Absolutely first The lake. It's a cliche, but it's the best. It's a good one. I'm scared, I guess I'm scared of stuff not working out. But that's a meta thing, really, isn't it? But again, if you let that stop you, you've just got to keep buggering on. I'm with Churchill. Keep going. Don't have courage. What's left on your to-do list? Oh, so much stuff. Yeah, you know, get married, have kids on the personal level front. So I'm kind of so so. Okay. Are you focused on that? It sounds um, like it's, are you I'm so broody. Really? Oh, uh, my lose my friends. Also, I've hit wedding season. Yeah, you know, six weddings this year. Five in the diary next year. That's a lot of weddings. To... You hit that age right where everyone starts getting married. And I like to think I've got a lot of friends. I do have a lot of friends. I'm having a certain birthday party and I. I really have over invited it. I looked at how many people invited and I was like, oh, you idiot. <clears throat> They're not all going to come. I re- well, they can't. They won't be able to fit. It's great fun, though. Yeah, it's a 1980s, it's a 1980s party. God. 1989 theme. Brilliant. So I've sent everyone a list of stuff. Who are you going as? 300. Well, I kind of want to go as me because I was born in those. You're going to go as a baby, though? Well, no, no. So I don't know. I don't know. It's probably terrible, but I was looking at stuff that was made in 1989 and Baywatch, and I do have a like, red Baywatch. swimsuit. Baywatch. Wear, but I just want to a bit objectifying. But um, on the other hand, it would be quite fun. I don't know. I do have part of me just wants to go as a like completely cliche but amazing like sequin 1980s style thing. So I need to the wear hair, the big ev- hair. everything. Yeah, actually yeah. do it properly. And I'm trying. Maybe. I've just ordered like a giant Rubik's cube and a giant massive neon boombox for the room. Sounds like a very cool party. Well, you're, you're of course incredibly welcome. Um, Gate crash. No, no, you'd be invited. Yeah, it's gay fashion, I think. Uh, maybe I'm being too honest in this conversation, but you know, you, you go away for a few years, you come back, you kind of reevaluate your life. So basically, I'm in that stage. It's not a bad place to be. No, I, it's exciting. Like I'm not. I don't want to be. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I don't think about it in a depressive way. I think about mm. it in an exciting way. And hopefully, there are lots of options. But yeah, what, what I want to do that. I just. I just. I. I'm so. I don't know what's happened. I'm so broody. I can't. Literally, I can't let a baby go past me without. <laughs> desperately wanting to take it and I've got a few young ones in my family and I just adore them and they like me and oh, they nice. I am everyone says I know everyone says this but like everyone says I'm good with kids if you meet and any, any of my friends in my family will be like yeah she is amazing and they all when they stand in the window and they say Emily Emily when you get out of the door to come meet me you're like it's very cute I'm a big hit with the under fives 
<laughs> I was speaking with the under fives on Camp Petra. I remember one guy desperately wanted to decorate his bike with Emily Ben posters. And That's one way in, I think. One guy wanted to, one guy, I said, one three or four year old was like, oh, I'm trying to practice cross the road. Can you cross the road? Hold it by hand. And I was like, yeah, oh, of course, that's course, lovely. Course, course. And then the thing about politics is I'm interested in it. I really want to do it, but I'm, where's the outlet? For the right reasons and the right Yeah, I'm not, parties, I can't, well, like, yeah, exactly. I can't, I can't do something I didn't believe in. Mm. And it's not, it's not, a, as I say earlier, it's not a question of having to agree with everything because obviously not. There are some things I can't just allow, I can't just accept. I couldn't look at myself in the eyes, I couldn't look at my family in the eyes if I allowed it. And that's not to say you don't, you don't, you don't try and change it from within. I, I'm not saying that that's not a valid thing to do. Of course it is, otherwise nothing would ever change. Mm. But how and in what outlet, I don't know yet. But, you know, hopefully, um, I mean, going back to the kindness and collaboration thing, it's the unkindness about it that I just don't like. I mean, I don't. And maybe it's having been such a cliche, but I haven't been bullied by you. Just don't like unkindness because you know what it does to people and it's not very nice. <laughs> Just putting it lightly. <laughs> so uh change the world. Well I want a little bit little bit by little bit. Nothing would ever change if people don't try and make a change. The thing I find most frustrating is people not understanding their own agency and how things can actually happen. And there's so much to do. So much to do. And I know it's so easy for someone like me to say because I've had all the opportunities and I'm unbelievably lucky and I just feel I owe it. To have had these amazing opportunities, A, don't waste them and B, work as hard as you can so other people can enjoy them because otherwise you've wasted your time. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Women of the Future podcast. If you enjoyed it, please hit the subscribe button. And while you're there, why not give us a rating and review? You know you want to. For more about the Women of the Future awards, network and initiative, please visit www.womenofthefuture.co.uk. See you soon.